Um, our next speaker is Dr. Lisa Leffert. She is an associate professor at Harvard Medical School uh, in anesthesia with uh, expertise and uh, subspecialty in obstetric anesthesia. Good morning. So when you talk about OBGYN and opioids, some things come to mind. And I thought I would start for those of people who like the answer first with a potential list. So the list has a lot of things that says open on them. And basically, when I talk to my colleagues, some experts like Dr. Meyer, who are on the panel here, and also a cursory, although not systematic, review of the literature, things like open hysterectomy, myomectomy, came up to mind, as well as major procedures that were reconstruction, things that were minimally evasive, invasive, particularly in the era of ERAS, or enhanced recovery after surgery protocols, are really a moving target and getting less and less so. And those in the next group were not on a never con meaning contraindicated list, but certainly much less likely to require opioids. The criteria used to identify the procedures, certainly the impact and feasibility of opioid sparing maneuvers, which you've heard a lot about and from my anesthesia colleague a moment ago, the degree of tissue disruption, the frequency of the procedure, something like cesarean delivery, the most common procedure done, very important to think about. Enhanced recovery after surgery protocols, they're plentiful, but not standardized in any way. And then the anticipated time of discharge was something that came up that surprised me, which is some of my surgical colleagues said, in some sense, if the patient's going home right away or with a block that's still underway, it's a little bit hard to know just how much pain they're going to be in, and I feel more like I need to prescribe opioids. There are some lessons learned from OB and opioids. There's a nice sort of robust group of data. We know that opioid-naive women will become persistent opioid users, about one in 300, and we know some risk factors that will increase that. We know from the Johns Hopkins paper, actually, that patients actually on the, on the panel, on their expert panel, opted for fewer opioids than their surgeons did. But we also know that the more opioids, as was mentioned previously, prescribed in the hospital, the more opioids patients take at home. We also know from our data that the more opioids the patient are sent home with, the more they actually take, even though they have no better satisfaction and no difference in pain scores. We also know that undertreatment of pain is more likely to tr cause chronic pain in the future. So we're having an effect in everything we do in terms of the opioids we prescribed. And we're continuously and iteratively having an effect. And we need to be really thinking of that when we're doing guidelines. We also know that it, sharing the decision-making with patients can impact. And then, as has been repeated multiple times, all of these multimodal things can impact how many opioids we need. It, in some cases, there's data as to whether or not they actually, one of these multimodal things are better than another, and there isn't uniform availability to all patients in all settings. And finally, there are high-intensity pain patients, as we call them, who just fit in a different category. Hot off the press, we have now most recently found out that if you just change an order set so that opioids aren't immediately available on the order set post-operatively, that someone has to go in and order them if requested, you can actually impact the number of opioids not only used in the hospital, but that the patients use at home. And finally, I'll just say in terms of the non-surgical opioid prescribing in OB, that we've talked about a lot of indications where opioids are not indicated, for example, migraine. So what do you give pregnant patients who have these common aches and pains. Opioids aren't perfect, and there's data talking about the ways in which they're not. But many of the medications that were talked about today are actually, there's data to say that they should not be used in pregnant women. So we haven't cracked that nut yet. So I'll leave you there and look forward to the comments and questions afterwards.